Welcome back for another study on the study of the Bible. Or is it a study of the study of the Bible? It can be both, I think. Can't yeah. It? Yes. So we're only showing on one of the two stations that we follow. Oh, we're on both of them now. But no one's watching. No one's watching yet. Oh, you poor thing. But um, we'll, we won't tell them to say hi to us now. No, because nobody will. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Uh, we are rapidly approaching Advent. I nearly said Lent again, but I, my brain did the right thing. And with that, we will be switching our study over to our Advent program. Our Advent program for 2021, which will be about Rublev's icon of the Holy Trinity. Um, Father Lewis introduced this to us. Was it in Lent? It seems a long time ago, but, yeah. but everything kind of merges together. It's kind of a pandemic thing where I can't tell it was this year, last year. It's just strange. But yeah. I know at some point uh, we looked at it uh, kind of in passing um, as part of Lent, maybe this past year of the year before. Yeah. Or... But we did it. And um, Father Lewis uh, bought me a copy of it. And it's absolutely beautiful. And so that will be, we'll be using that. And um, because it's Advent, we'll be looking towards the, you know, the, the coming of Jesus, but not the baby Jesus. It's to do with the, uh, the return of Jesus. You know, it's uh, the, the sequel, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> I'll be back. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you are on, I'm, I see there are two people. Vern says, hello, good morning all. And good morning back at you. Um, so say hi uh, we don't bite we are not vampires so in the meantime we have this week and next week to cover a couple of hard subjects um, now we will be returning to this course on the uh, a wrathful god and the biblical witness the funny the scary and the just plain weird in our bibles because um, i think it's interesting and but nobody said to me, this is the most boring thing since the last most boring thing. So. <laughs> since the last time you were on TV. <laughs> that could be a week by week challenge, yeah. really, couldn't it? But um, we, one of the reasons why we, we're digging in uh, into Abram stroke Abraham so much is because of where I want us to go. And all of this is just foundational. All of this about Abraham and Abraham and Sarah is just foundational for where I would want us to go, and we we are taking our time on purpose so that we lay the proper foundation, and that we like a movie. Uh, we have uh, left a lot of plot. What do they call it? Where they give you know if you subplot. No, no, no. It's where where they give you. Something which comes in useful oh, later. Foreboding or um, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. So that we've already la laid a lot of foreshadowing stuff for you to kind of recognize, hopefully, later when we get to where we want to go. And I'm being kind of secret cryptic. about it. Cryptic, yes, because uh, I find this exciting. Um, and I, I, I hope by the time we get there, you will equally be excited. Kit, hi, Father. It was a lovely service last night, Father. It was so it was so nice to hear you celebrate the service. Yes, it's been a long time, and uh, it, it was good to hear you, and it allowed me to loll around and do nothing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and most of you would have heard his prayer at the end of the service. Um, Oh, I didn't. When he didn't off switch the off the microphone, that was the one in the sacristy, and it is the end prayer um, that uh, is used. Um, but he says it so nicely, and he actually remembers the words. In and I don't. Uh, so yes, um, you may want to study that. And he did kind of cover the microphone, but those microphones don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Father L, can you please translate your T-shirt? Oh, yes. What does it say in the first place? Read it out. Can you read it in? Oh, it's not. It's not in mirror language. No, so no, can... it's Latin, and it's kind of a um, a translation of how much wood would woodchuck chuck if woodchuck could chuck wood, but in Latin, 
it's kind of like how much how much material will a um, woodchuck? So where's the woodchuck bit? Marmota. Yeah, marmota. That's right here. You're weird. Uh, yes, I know. And I, know. when I say that, <laughs> in all loving kindness, yes, I know. It's got to be true. Well, not got to be true, but it, you know, it's, it's weird calling weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. The pot calling the kettle. All right, yes, Bill, we're here. The YouTube on the tube has been persnickety. Uh, there is a warning here on the mic that your content is mature. Yes, it is. Um, we'll get there, and I will give a another warning on this. Uh, um, it's it's one of the YouTubey things that you're supposed to have to do. There are certain words that uh, if you watch some YouTube videos, they, they just don't say, and I'm not talking about curse words, just words that as christians we would use in normal uh language Parlance, yeah. Par -parlance, yeah. but uh, that's not it this is something far different so let's uh, recap last week uh, right in genesis chapter 17 god speaks to abram and reminds abram that he has not forgot his promise to him god then changes abram's name and he becomes abraham God also changes Sarai's name, and she becomes Sarah. God returns to his theme of giving Abram, now Abraham, a son, at which Abraham falls on his face laughing. A covenant is then established, and here God tells Abraham that circumcision will be required of him and all the males in his household. In chapter 18 of Genesis, we are introduced to three strangers who are walking by Abraham's tent upon which Abraham invites them to rest a while and then shows them the utmost hospitality and welcome. These three strangers reiterate God's promise of a child for Abraham and Sarah. Abraham thinks that Ishmael, his, his son, is good enough, but God disagrees. Meanwhile, it is Sarah's turn to laugh when she listens in on the strangers telling Abraham that this time next year, Sarah will have given birth. Now, because both Abraham and Sarah have laughed at this idea, the child to be born is to be named Isaac, which means he laughs. Now, I, I was saying this to, why shouldn't it be they laugh? Um, or, you know, some, some kind of plural thing rather than he laugh. And we tried to work out what it would possibly no, be. No, you, you tried to work out. Well, I, I don't know I the just Hebrew, I just of, made it of, all up. I was kind of sitting there going, I, I don't see why this is relevant. <laughs> So you see how pathetic some of the rabbit holes are? <laughs> now the chapter continues with the strangers saying that they are making their way to Sodom, whereupon God begins a discussion with Abraham regarding the reason for the visit there. We discover that Sodom and Gomorrah are such dodgy places that their sins cry out to God. God is bent on destroying them, but Abraham barters with God by suggesting that a just God could never destroy a place that has righteous people in it. Chapter 18 ends with God saying that even if he finds ten righteous people, then he will not destroy Sodom. We will now look at chapter 19 of Genesis, mm -hmm. a chapter that has a whole history of its own. A chapter that has been used to marginalize and persecute a distinct group of people for centuries. To say that our look at this chapter will be contentious is an understatement. We are pretty sure that the ingrained beliefs of more than a few of us will, uh, will, they, uh, the, uh, will ch uh, accuse us of misrepresenting Scripture. And so to those views, though challenged, will probably remain the same. But the evidence we will present not only will be overwhelming, it will be of impeccable provenance. And this is where I come to the warning part. The chapter uh, involves us discussing mature issues regarding human sexuality and also rape culture. And if you think that this is not for you, then please switch off. You have been warned. Now this is chapter 19 of Genesis. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, 
turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast, and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, so that we may know them. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not yet known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men." for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they replied, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot, and came near the door to break it down. But the men inside reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place? For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of this city. But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and left him outside the, hit, the city. When they brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life, do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you will be consumed. And Lot said to them, O oh, no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the hills, for fear the disaster will overtake me, and I die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Very well, I grant you this favor too, and will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth, when Lot came to Zoar. Now there were two footnotes in here, one in verse 17, which in our translation read, when they brought them outside, they said, mm -hmm. and in some, uh, some variants, yeah, yeah, it says, uh, brought them outside and he, he said, said. Yeah. meaning the angel the group of angels is now being referred to as singular. As a singular. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the word Zoar it actually means, means little, little. <laughs> in Hebrew. And uh, yeah, Lot says there's a little place called... Little. So it actually got named Little Place. The other thing to note is that the when the word Lord appears, uh, for the most part, it's uh, in capitals. So we know what that means now. So it's something to, to keep in mind. That was a long scripture reading. It went over four slides, so well, three, four slides to make sure you could 
uh, have the text big enough it, to yeah. see to see. Now, if you ask the average person about this passage, it's likely that the first thing to come to mind, their mind, when, you, when once you mention the word Sodom, is that this passage is to do with God destroying Sodom because of homosexuality. So, it seems to be quite incontrovertible to say that because of this chapter in Genesis, along with a few other verses, we have definite proof of God being against homosexuality. True? No. You'll see why when we do what we've been doing over the past few months and use our five contexts to look at this text closely. So let's look at the immediate context. Oh, I like that. I know. What do you mean, like the picture? Yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I should have gotten the name of the, the artist. Um, we read in, in the previous chapter, chapter 18, about Abraham sitting at his tent and seeing strangers in the distance. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favour with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on, since you have become to your servant. Now, there is a similarity with the opening of chapter 19, and the similarities are striking. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. The, is this a, a coincidence? Uh, hardly. What seems to be the context here is that the offering of hospitality and its consequences. Remember, hospitality was such a big deal in this culture that it could literally mean the difference between life and death. In these two chapters, both Abraham and Lot are showing real great hus hospitality. For Abraham, his hospitality is immediately received. Lot, on the other hand, had to work a little harder. But both people offered hospitality to strangers, which was then received. Once inside the house, Lot prepares a feast and then prepares for them all to go to bed. But then there's a knock on the door. Indeed, it turns into a cacophony as a group of people surround the house. Let's look at that group of people consisting of the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. The text goes out of its way to tell us that it wasn't just a few men, but all of the men. And the text doesn't just tell us it was all of the men, it also tells us both young and old to the last man. The detail here is important, as it will become clear later. Lot answers the door, and the men make a demand. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. A lot of ink has been spelled over the meaning of the word no. Here, the Hebrew, as in English, can mean many things, and it has been suggested that the men at the door were merely asking to be introduced to the visitors. Most scholars, however, agree that the use of the word no has a sexual meaning. We would agree and find this meaning accurate within its context, and Lot does seem to reinforce this understanding. Lot went out of the door to the men and shut the door after him. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never established the habit of locking the door behind me when people have asked to, to be introduced to my guests. So Lot suspects something, and this is confirmed by what he says next. I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. 
Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Now, things of importance to note here are Lot identifies with these men as his brothers. Lot offers his daughters both virgins as a peacemaker and Lot acts responsibly towards protecting his visitors. Now, point two will seem absolutely barbaric to us and the implication being that his daughters are of less worth than his visitors. But two things need to be mentioned here. One is the patriarchal nature of this, this society and the other is the high sense of obligation in protecting one's visitors, as absurd as that may sound. But the men of Sodom are having none of this. They replied, stand back. And they continued with an ob observation about Lot that changes the whole character of this interaction. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. In Mosaic law, being an alien should have meant that Lot would have had the same rights and the same status as a native. But in Sodom, these rights were totally ignored. Lot was not seen as a brother, but as a foreigner with no rights. This kind of reminds me of uh, when I lived in South Tampa, there, the, the established old Tampa natives that lived in South Tampa, um, they, were, they were the natives. And even though you might have been living in that community for 25, 30 years, you were st still not a South Tampa. Nom, 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 nom. Well, the same happened with me, that uh, as long as I don't open my mouth, people look at me and assume I'm, I'm a native uh, of the US. And, but as soon as I open my mouth, they then think otherwise, even though I am um, naturalized. And they say but things that's... like, boy, you're not from around here, are you? Well, I wasn't even living here then, but that was in uh, <laughs> South Carolina, I think it was, in Books A Million, when I was in the line. And this little guy with a big hat, he was way younger than me, he says, when I asked is this the uh, the queue the, the back of the queue and it, the, oh, I mean the end of the line and he, he looked at me really curious and said boy I guess you're not from around here and apparently that is the um, you know call me boy is something that was a bit of an insult but I just internally giggled because he was like playing to a stereotype I'd seen on um, oh what's it called uh, the one with the car that used to jump all over the place. Dukes of Hazard. So, oh. <laughs> so I was just laughing inside. It was rather cute. <laughs> well, we mention Mosaic Law here not because it existed within the context of this story, but because the writers of the story certainly would have understood the horror of what was going on. And when one considers that most scholars believe that this sort of story was circulating during the Babylonian exile, then one can see that the Israelites would have been living their own alien existence. Now, just please note there, for those of you who may want to sort of... Uh, ponder? Ponder or say something. Um, the story was circulating doesn't necessarily mean it was actually committed to... Writing down. Papyrus. Yeah. <laughs> So after this, the men try to burst into the house, but Lot is rescued by the strangers, and the door shut, and the men are made blind. We do not need to go any further with this story because what we need to discuss in it has we have what we need to discuss has already been read. So let us recall what the problem is with this text. Well, the problem is that for most people. Chapter 19 of Genesis is understood to be about the sin of homosexuality. But chapter 19 is actually about the sin of the lack of hospitality and the abuse of strangers. We are both fully aware of how silly it may sound to our ears that God would be, be willing to destroy people because of their lack of hospitality. Just... Uh. 
because however much we may like to be hospitable, we would never think it much of a big deal if others weren't hospitable. We'd kind of say, oh, are they miserable people? Eh? Yeah. They, they don't even offer you a cup of tea. But that just goes to show just how much hospitality meant in this culture. It was a moral obligation. Of course, there's no way of getting around the sexual aspect of this story. So once again, let us look at the details here. When I can find a button. There we go. All men and boys of the city were at Lot's door. They all wanted to know, let the reader understand, Lot's guests. Lot offered them his daughters to do what they wanted with them, and the men refused. Now, my introduction to this story uh, has to be placed within the context that is still probably the, the common recognition that this is about the sin of homosexuality. That's how I was taught about it as a kid. But even back then, it just didn't make any sense to me. Why? Well, because Sodom would have needed to be full of 100% gay men. Lot would need to be clueless of his, uh, to offer his daughters to a city that was 100% gay men. The text just doesn't mention homosexuality. And actually, the men then threaten, threaten to rape Lot because he's an alien. So basically what this story is telling us is that the men of the city were bent on intimidating and dominating a group of foreign men who thought they could come into their city without permission. And, and, and there's a word for this, xenophobia. The main point here is that the sin God was to destroy Sodom for was nothing had nothing to do with homosexuality. It was to do with a total lack of hospitality and care for the stranger. Now, here is where our context and our experience of the text comes into play. Because it is very difficult for us to read the text in any other way than that which we grew up with, and so, for many people, what we have said, that this text has nothing to do with homosexuality, will be ignored. But we do not wish this text to stand on its own as proof, and we will offer some more evidence. And so here we go. In Deuteronomy 29, 32, 31 to 33, Lamentations 4, Isaiah 1 and 3, Amos 1 and 2, Zephaniah 2, from Deuteronomy to Lamentations, from Isaiah and Jeremiah to Zephaniah, the Hebrew Bible knew quite clearly what the sin of Sodom was, that they loved neither God nor neighbor, but worshipped idols, were proud and arrogant, oppressed the poor, crushed the needy, were cruel and violent, and failed to show their sacred duty of hospitality to the stranger. Ezekiel is most explicit. As I live, says the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty, they did abominable things before me, therefore I removed them when I saw it. Ezekiel doesn't say what the abominable things are, which some people have unnecessarily and with a quite a leap of uh, interpretation, have interpreted this as homosexuality. But the Hebrew word to'iva, is broad and can mean all kinds of sin. And as in chapter 16 of Ezekiel says nothing about sex, never mind homosexuality, so we can be certain that the context clearly defines the term as a failure to care for the needy. 
Wisdom 19.15 says that God punishes Sodom for having received strangers with hostility. And there are additional non-canonical Jewish writings from the 2nd and 1st centuries BC that say much the same thing. Moreover, a modern rabbi, Stephen Nathan, wrote, We read in Midrash Pirkei, Pirkei Eliezer, a collection of rabbinic homilies collected in the 3rd and 4th centuries in the land of Israel, that any resident of these cities, Sodom or Gomorrah, who attempted to give food or aid to the poor was subject to death. As a matter of fact, this same Midrash tells us that Lot's daughter was convicted of giving bread to a poor person each time she went to the well for water. And as people began her execution, she cried out to God. It was this cry that reached God and prompted him to send the messengers, angels, to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if their sin was as great as her cry would imply. And for what we hope is the final nail in the coffin of Genesis' story being about homosexuality, let's listen to what Jesus has to say. Likewise, just as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all. And that's from Luke. From Matthew we hear, If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So, how did this text get connected with homosexuality? Well, the first thing we need to note is that it took something like 500 years after the compilation of Genesis before a Jewish philosopher, Philo of Alexandria, first equated Sodom's sin with homosexuality. Before this, absolutely no biblical writers equated this wickedness with homosexual acts. When it comes to the Christian church, we begin with the early church fathers, and of course, we have to deal with their own context. Now, the early church moved from its Jewish origins into a Greco-Roman context quite rapidly. And because of this, there developed great tensions between the two. Um, you can read a lot of this in, in Paul's writings, especially. Um, say, for instance, am I allowed to eat food that has been offered to an idol? And Paul says, well, if you can do it on your own, it doesn't bother anyone, sure. But if somebody's weaker and, you know, it it's going to upset them. and upsets them, don't do it. So there's this tension that goes on and it, it goes on at multi levels um, because the two, con the two cultures were just so different. So because of this great uh, tension, Judaism assumed a kind of de facto position in terms of morality and belief. You know, we know God, we have the one God. And as we, we, we realize Christ is the Messiah, um, therefore our morality is way better than yours, so stop doing what you're doing. But even if that was the case, it still had to deal with Roman and Greek ideas and experiences of morality. And this is further muddied by the lives of converts who experienced whose experiences were immersed in the Greco-Roman world. Now, perhaps the best example of this is St. Augustine of Hippo. Um, he is one of the great fathers of the church. You know, he's got millions of writings, um, and you know, we, we owe him a great deal. But his background is, well, he was a man who spent a great deal of his life living a somewhat dissolute existence. Um, but all, all along the way, his saintly and Christian mother, Monica, followed him everywhere and was constantly praying for his conversion. That he, he Augustine, became a great apologist for the Christian faith is undisputed. But it's also indisputable that he brought quite a lot of his personal experience to bear on his understanding of the Christian faith. 
And here's an example. Augustine believed that Adam's prelapsarian erection, and the word prelapsarian means um, before the fall, uh, would have been under Adam's own voluntary control. And that the passionate, troubling, disobedient sexual impulses we experience in our post-lapsarian, which is after the fall experience, are part of the punishment visited on humankind by God. And that sexual activity between married spouses, if done for its own pleasurable sake and not for procreation, is a sin. But, Augustine says, it's a forgivable sin. I mean, isn't that just weird? <laughs> I mean, weird, period. Now, if he wrote stuff like that, and he wrote way more stuff like that, it should come as no surprise then to learn that the man who gave us both the three-volume work on the Holy Trinity that ends with a prayer saying, oh God, forgive me, I'm an absolute failure, even though I've written all this stuff, um, and also gave us the doctrine of original sin, which, meh, could also use Philo's belief about Sodom about being about homosexuality. Moving on, we find that the Genesis story was used by other early church fathers to kick against, of all things, Greco-Roman philosophical notions of male sexuality and the cultic use of male prostitutes. Then there is the Christian commentator John Chrysostom, one of the most prolific biblical writers of the 4th, 4th century, who criticised homosexual acts, but who did so as part of an ascetic condemnation of all sexual experiences. He didn't have anything against it per se. He just didn't like sex. Full Period. stop. Yeah. Moreover, it was generally not the homosexual sex act itself that was sinful but some consequence, such as how participating in an act might violate social norms like gender hierarchies. Now, nowadays, when we talk about gender and stuff like that, we think we're so modern. You know, don't we? But this is fourth century stuff. And when it talks about gender hierarchies, these social norms included that men are dominant, women are passive in most circumstances. And so within this understanding, if a man took on the passive role in a same-sex act, he was understood to be taking on the woman's role. Thus he was unmasculine and effeminate a transgression of the gender hierarchy that Philo of Alexandra called the greatest of all evils. The concern was to police gender roles rather than sex acts in and of themselves. And this is where we get to the nub of things. Power and authority in male sexuality. Let us revisit the story of Sodom, but let us look at it from a different point of view. When the two strangers, and some say angels, arrive in Sodom, Lot and his family receive them warmly. Then the men of Sodom come to Lot's house and demand that the two visitors be handed over to them. From what is said, we can tell that the Sodomites' intentions were overly sexual, so that we may know them. From this precy, we might conclude that the townsmen of Sodom were homosexual, but the truth is that these men were no more homosexual than are the bullies in our prisons who rape new newcomers and weaker prisoners on a daily basis. Yes, these acts are of a thoroughly sexual nature, but these attacks are essentially acts of aggression against another against those who are weaker and those who are different. Prison rapists are carrying on an ancient patriarchal tradition where the dominant male has the right to penetrate anyone subordinate to him, women, lower men, boys and slaves, and we rightly find this quite despicable. The same thing of power rape appears in the story we've held back from mentioning until now the story of the Levite in Judges 19. Put simply, in, in the Judges 19 story, one night in the land of Benjamin, a Levite and his concubine find themselves in Gibeah, 
where they were put up by a kindly old man. As in Sodom, the men of the city come and demand their assumed right to abuse the stranger. The old man offers them his virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine, but the Levite insists that only his woman be taken. The men of Gibeah rape her to death, and the next day the Levite divided up her body into twelve pieces and sent them each to the twelve tribes of Israel. When the Israelite leaders met at Mitzpah, they decided that the Benjamites should be punished for their abomination, the way in which they acted. Yeah, uh, to the point that they were almost annihilated. Um, so obviously this isn't the thing to do in any way, shape or form. Now we should remember here that Lot also offered his daughters to the mob to save his guests from attack. This shows us that the main issue here is not the abuse of women, sorry ladies, but the honour of men. We can say this because if the mistreatment of women was the issue, then Lot and the Levite in, in this uh, latest thing, uh, would, it would just be as guilty as the Sodomites and the, the Gibeons. So what we have here is what we can call uh, a machismo culture in which weirdly a man can preserve his honour by being literally on top but who loses his honour if he allows himself to be the passive partner. The point of these stories, however, goes even further beyond the crazy hierarchy of top males. The message is that those uh, who embrace those different from themselves, as Abraham and Lot embrace the strangers, are seen as blessed by God. While those who discriminate against the stranger, discriminate against the alien and the different, as did the men of Sodom and Gibeah, are seen as despised by God. <sighs> well, that was a heck of a lot of work to get through, but we hope it was worth it for you. And we hope, also hope you see how the various contexts allow us to see the original intent of the writings. Now, we've got um, 15 minutes left. If you have any questions about that, um, please um, do. Uh, write your questions. First, just send us a, a question mark uh -huh. and then write your question yeah. down. That way we know some questions are coming. And hello, Karen. Glad you're here. Bill, Bill has, has, has a question mark. Yeah. Uh, now, another thing to add here is I hope it helps you see how our own context can interfere with what the Bible's trying to tell us. Sometimes the Bible is just weird and wacky to our sensibilities, which means we have a lot of work to get the Bible to speak to us uh, in its own language, basically, um, in its own context. Um, and sometimes um, it's, it, it really is hard work, isn't it? Yeah, it really, really is hard. So how does Gomorrah get into the story? Uh, the kind of twin towns, um, it was really interesting because every time I, um, this is a song that Elton John wrote. Uh, um, it, it, well, he, he wrote it in one of his early albums, um, and Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, and it seems historically they're always twinned together, but it's kind of interesting how within the biblical text, Gomorrah seems to just disappear. Yeah. Um, and I did look into this because I was interested and I really didn't get that far as to uh, me, it just seemed to be twinned. Uh, I came from a place called Newton, but it's a part of a town called Hyde. Um, so when you addressed it, it was Newton, Hyde, Cheshire. Um, I'm sure if I just put Newton, Cheshire, and the, then the postcard, I still will, would have received it. So I'm just thinking it's kind of linked. Um, I'm sure there are other towns that are... It must be something in, say, a place like New York that uh, you can't was New York, New York. I mean, I never knew that, you know. New York was just New York. I didn't realise it was also a state. Um, so when somebody said Rochester, New York, I was thinking, oh, maybe Rochester's in... New York City. Yeah. It's a bit like... It, but then real, you know. So maybe it's something like that. I don't know. I will continue to dig because it is an interesting question for... Uh, me anyway. 
And obviously for Bill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Well, uh, like we said right at the beginning, um, this w next week will be the final week before um, we will then yeah, start yeah. our Advent um, course. Um, and so the whole subject matter will change. We'll shift from... Oh, we've got two question marks from Kit. It's a doubly important question. Okay, here we <laughs> or, go. Or it's a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, more questions. Good, good. Well, while you're right here, just talk about... Uh, so next week will be our final one to do with the this this subject, the wrath of God and um, scripture. And also then we'll have a break for a week is it or two mm -hmm. weeks it's thanksgiving oh yeah so we're away one week thanksgiving the next so it'll be a two-week break and then we'll be back with our advent um would you like to talk about it instead of me because i messed it up earlier on it was gibberish <laughs> <laughs> there is a um an icon a russian icon that many many people have seen called uh the trinity and it was painted or written, as the Orthodox say, by, um, by a Anton Rupolev. They, they, they don't paint icons, they say they're written? They're written. Hmm. Yeah, they don't, they don't paint them. And one of the things that we'll do is kind of go into the process of, of writing an icon, which is quite, um, quite a, a production because it, it, it Im involves prayer, fasting, using certain materials, and doing things over and over and over again. It's a, quite a quite a process. Wow. And but this um, this piece of of art, this this icon, has some very strong theological messages. And as Western Christians, we don't usually look at art and think, oh, I'm getting information, you know, theological information. I'm getting a visual representation of some idea. But icons actually give the viewer information, theological information, uh, belief information about what they're seeing. And that's kind of what we will be doing with... Um, with the uh, the Rublev, uh Trinity. Now I have to tell you that I will be learning as much as you. Um, so I am the student here. Um, so Father Lewis is leading this um, and I'll, I will be reduced to slides and music, I think. Um, so you won't be hearing much from me. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> now, you have all heard that. <laughs> and when the time comes, we might have to have some <laughs> some witnessing. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I could be in the background painting, doing the painting by numbers <laughs> version. <of it. laughs> Can you tell what it is yet? Because and I think I would do a really, really lousy job as well. <laughs> There's kids' question. All right. Okay. Grappling with the gender hierarchy. Thank you for explaining it. So this means that all these stories are really in the context of a rapacious culture. Ooh, the word rapacious. Mm. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought rapacious, rapacious. I can't, I can't even think what it means now, the word rapacious. Rape-filled? Well, uh, within this context. Um, it's to take, isn't it? If somebody's rapacious. Um, well, all hierarchies are kind of like that, aren't they? It's, it's one of the things that you notice within... Um, the first few chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, when they share all things in common, it was worth noting. Um, and with Jesus, the kind of hierarchies within society of the untouchables, you know, the, the lepers, the tax collectors, Jesus did his best to make sure he touched all those people who society says, uh-uh. So, yeah, within, um, we have to deal with, uh, the societies as they existed and not how we would want them to have exist existed um, I mean, which is a very pertinent thing to say in today's 
uh, US society mm -hmm. with what's going on with history and how it's taught in schools. Uh, again, one of those let the reader understand things. Um, so it strikes me, this is Kip speaking, that if one interprets chapter 19 as being about homosexuals, then one thing can ignore God's message as to how we should treat immigrants. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it, when people distort scripture for whatever reason, um, historically uh, or even today, um, it, it's, it says more about the person who's doing the distortions than it is and it doesn't matter if you're distorting it in a conservative way or a, a, a liberal way let me get that clear as well there isn't just one way of distorting scripture um you can uh, distort the language used and, and say you're claiming to go to some meaning of the greek for example like some of the jesus uh, um seminar. seminar people um and and so it actually means this uh and bishop spong was terrible in his use of greek new testament greek because he do he would do that all the time he would take a fairly common greek word uh he would find the most remote obscure an obscure meaning for it and they would make all what he was going to say spin on that meaning um so that's um one way of doing doing it um if you are um someone who wants to um say something well uh, here's another example it's not just about immigrants uh one of the uh i can't remember as a senator or a house representative um talked about the bible saying jesus says the poor you will always have with you as if that was uh, enough to not bother about having poor people in the in american society they're um, not helping uh, yeah, not helping yeah. poor people we, jesus said this so why should we bother helping them and it's the same with immigrants. Um, you know, you've got a wonderful poem that's written inside uh, the Statue of Liberty, uh, which is now basically ignored. Um, and the people who are saying this, uh, that you know, that uh, immigration is a problem, are themselves children of immigrants. <laughs> that's the thing. Mm. Um, and the people who are saying that immigra immigration is a bad thing because it messes up society and creates a mess. Well, yes, it does. Um, but it's the, the melting pot of ideas and cultures that have, has made America what it is, the most powerful country in the world. Um, yes. So, as I've always said, you can make scripture say anything um, within the context uh, that, you, that you're willing to ignore. But taking scripture at its own um, value is is hard it's dangerous and it's you know it it really strikes home just what jesus is calling us to be when he talks about us being his disciples um that we don't pick and choose that we, we shouldn't pick and choose every one of us does every one of us is a heretic in some way shape or form apart from father lewis <laughs> <laughs> Because he told oh, me, dear. because oh, he dear. told me he's not a heretic. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, yeah, for today's culture, the we we really need to get wise to what Scripture actually does say, rather than what we want it to say, and the two couldn't be further apart. Uh, am I free of the sin of uh, exegesis? My style? Nope, I am not. Um, and what I try to avoid when I when I sermonize, for well, however long those sermons may be, long or longer, um, is or is, too long, or is to just take one verse and use that as my proof text to say something which it may not actually be saying. Uh, I always, and one of the reasons sometimes that my sermons get extended is because I'm trying to put that those verses within the context. And one, one of my major peeves, pet peeves for the um, lectionary as we have it, is that it loves um, skipping verses and it loves cutting out context for, for its readings, especially with the gospel reading, um, which bugs me no end because, you know, it's setting you up 
to say something which the text isn't actually saying. And so you've got to tell people, I, I feel I need to, that here we go, this is, but it said this before and it says this afterwards. And the missing verses say this. Um, and then you can get on with the sermon. And so, Bill, yes, long. <laughs> Mentioned sermon and Bill says long. Long. <laughs> Oh dear. Just think of all the extra sleep you're getting. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> well, any more questions? Any more question marks? Now for next week, we're going to switch gears and go on to a completely different subject. And the reason why we're going to go to this subject, which will only tell you next week is because we've come across so many different videos on YouTube that have been talking about it and almost every one of them has approached it in a an our cultural way rather than using the context of when the, the, it was written and the, th the various things and understandings were written so hopefully this will be a kind of another object lesson of how we have to be aware of who we are and what our context is um, and there you go. So, without further ado, thank you for joining us. Um, have a great day. Um, if we don't see you on Sunday, um, hopefully you will see us by the wonders of the interweb. And we'll take care. And God bless. God bless. <laughs>